Okay. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us again for the last performance panel of Interrupt before the 6 o'clock keynote with Wafa Vala. Um, I'm really excited to introduce Sawako Nakayasu, who is a professor here in the Literary Arts Department, where she skews poetry with techniques of translation and performance, often both at the same time. She is the author of many books of poetry and the co-editor of, Trans of A Trans-Pacific Poetics with Lisa Samuels. About a year ago, she told me that improvising is indistinguishable from listening. I think about that often. Um, please join me in inviting her to the stage. Mm -hmm.
Girl talk. We are sitting around the table, eating and drinking and exchanging stories about flashers, gropers, underwear thieves, your general assortment of urban perverts. When I tell the story about the man who came up to me and opened up his bag and offered me one of a teeming million wiggling ants in his bag, the whole table goes silent and I am reminded all over again how hard it is to get along with the women in this country. Ant breath. Ari no koku. 
Twenty kokyu shiteiru ants are placed in a kokyu dekinai glass jar, about which they are not extremely happy. She, after a some wa time, set their top movements more slow down, ienai and a all li of ta as chi with wa half a totetsumonaku heart ku decide ru to she set e the ants free yo. The jar is opened. Wa ureshiwa, and the ants flee in a mad burst of energy. The jar is closed again. Karato omotara, a sealed, cloudy container full, ipaidayo, of the tortured breath of innocent ants.
So our next performers are Judd Morrissey and Abraham Adamson. Um, they make work that sits at the intersection of text, image, and code with the question of materialism always close at hand. As parts of the anatomical theater of mixed reality, which is cutely called Adam R, they merge live performance with a range of emerging technologies to construct a theatrical space of visual poetics. Judd, Judd is a professor at SAIC in Chicago, and Abraham is the artist in residence at the University of Washington in Bloomfield. Please join me in welcoming them to the stage. Someone told me that an old Victorian house was hoisted up from here <laughs> and taken away. <laughs> the inner walls were entirely covered in paper with rhinestone mosaics. The question is, 
Are we collapsing that house with his house? They all collapse into the bottomless abundance. Do not forget their language. I covered it with that shirt. This glyph takes the shape of its lumen and note the gorge of the throat where it is conceived as an opening that is both a hole and a star. A felching of fluids runs through our pipes and drips on my bare shoulders in the pleasure of a basement that takes the form of a star-shaped hole. A macrocosm of the body as a hollow place within it zeroing itself in advance of becoming the unfillable count, the bottomless abundance, a biosensis for a man. Asterisms, fluorescing in night, soil. When the bottom fell, I saw you spin. Your dust skirt hiked high, your gravity darkening. Foreman, prepare the hoist. Foreman to this not quite heterosexual fever, passing, passing, nights, ships, 
entangled Argos, binary stars. This long night's oil Bring her up. <laughs> Higher. <laughs> Luminous. Blue. Variable. Here's a trick for remembering. All those holes that we call bones in the body. It's a story about a cowboy named Turk. He sits on his saddle, Sela Tersica, and lassos his sweethearts, Foramen Lassarum. He looks out through his eye holes, optic foramen, to take stock of the valley, foramen ovale. Where we round up our cattle, foramen rotunda, and bury their horns in the night soil of a dazzling camo-flagellation. Now straining, give me utter. Now utter, give me hard. Now hard, give me withheld dread. Straining and utter. Now utter and heart. Now heart and withheld dread. Straining the utter, the utter of my heart, my heart, for its withheld dread, and flexing my mouth, my mouth for the quivering of a lavaria from inside my gore.
Nashville. This place draws kids like a magnet. You can see them down on Broadway and on Music Row with their old guitars and their fresh faces and all their wrinkled jeans. But you can see it in their eyes, though, the thing that sets them apart. It's the dream. It's the big dream. And the longing and the hope that suddenly, one day, there'll be a star. You know that's what it's all about for rhinestone cowboys. Rhinestone cowgirls, too. You know, I've been walking these streets so long. I just keep singing the same old song. Why well, gets under every crack on the dirty sidewalks here on Broadway? Well, hustle is the name of the game. And my sports get washed away like the snow.
Um, um, I want to open up the conversation to the room for questions and responses pretty quickly. But I'll ask a question first, which is just on the subject of discomfort and how that works for you as performers and as people creating spaces. Um, for in your piece, there's something so profoundly uncomfortable about watching you watch yourselves in a second <laughs> staging that was um, also like the discomfort of a cover or a camouflage um, mm. that was really interesting. <laughs> and I wonder about that. Um, and then in Sawako and Charlie's piece, um, Sawako had asked me to start clapping after um, Charlie exited the stage, and I've been so caught up with organizing this festival that, of course, I was just like, yes, I can do that, I can do anything, whatever will make it run most smoothly. Um, but I felt completely um, incapable of clapping um, <laughs> because I, I felt really emotional and, and, um, and kind of paralyzed in a way that I think Claire articulated well earlier, um, though a different context of just being frozen um, in a, a fearful sort of discomfort. Yeah, the, sorry, the question is yeah, just on the topic yeah. of discomfort. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, I, I felt, I don't know if discomfort's the right word, but certainly this, when the space is in sort of a tenuous situation where you're not sure exactly what's appropriate or what, um, or when you just want to be silent, when, people, when, the, when the space just wants, just sort of um, causes you to fall silent or something. So I don't, I don't feel like we had an instability necessarily as profound as the end of the first piece, um, where it sort of it sort of um, destabilized sort of the sense of like how a performance should end and how we should how we should respond. Um, but I think there's a sort of there is a kind of parallel in the sense that we're working in a way that the, the piece never really stabilizes. So there's a mix of us performing as amateurs, so I think there's a funny aspect with that, like an amateur theater kind of pantomime thing. Um, but then there's also the sense that we're always incorporating the space, so we're incorporating this, we're incorporating this. Um, so we're never really, um, we're always sort of learning the space, and we, we never can get too comfortable mm -hmm. in the space, mm -hmm. except to be comfortable with the space changing and us trying to perform the sort of presence that has an aspect of control. It was strange to watch ourselves perform uh, on the big screen. I don't know, it's interesting that you, that you call it uncomfortable. I don't know that that's what I would have expected necessarily. Um, but it is, I was sort of thinking, who are these two people? <laughs> what are they doing? <laughs> you know? Um, so it's kind of an interesting mirror, mirroring effect um, as a performer, um, and also, and also hopefully for the audience as well. Yeah, and then you know, this sense of space and time, the distance of space and time of, well, that was recorded on a particularly windy day on a beach in Chicago, and here we are uh, in Providence in February, and yeah. I was interested, Thea, in what you said about, um, actually, I guess you were quoting me, so not surprising <laughs> I was interested <laughs> about um, improvisation and listening. And uh, I, I kept thinking about that um, when I was watching your piece, um, Judd and Abraham, about what listening is um, and that it's so much more than a, a sonic thing, but just the, like the way you were listening to um, the space and um, a new space and that sense of familiarity in um, in a sort of a shifting uh, kind of architecture which um, I, I liked I somehow came back to thinking about your piece as very architectural um, and as sort of a moving architecture that was 
I don't know. I just, sorry, I lost my train a little bit. But um, uh, I felt I felt myself listening very differently in um, experiencing your piece. Mm. Also, I think that sometimes by rendering yourself legible, you kind of are letting go of, a, like, I feel sad. Like, that kind of erases all of those constituent parts. And so legibility is itself a form of erasure. And I was kind of moved to hmm. thinking about Shayla's piece as well, how self-care is kind of a form of erasure because it acknowledges a self that doesn't exist for other people because the angle of observation is itself the observation. And that can be embarrassing. Like, I, I think when you say discomfort, what I hear is embarrassment. Mm -hmm. Because it's, embarrassment for me is like, I don't know how to act mm -hmm. in the space yeah. that's being produced. And for me, that creates a lot of generative, like, tension between, like, the subject and the, the form of subjection through which um, legibility moves. So, yeah, I mean, Anything genuine is embarrassing. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> yeah. Uh, what? So, my question is about the curating of this performance. How the three come together? Because, like, I don't know if it was um, uh, planned or uh, it, it seems like there are a group of three different school of performances in a way. Yeah. <laughs> the humor is the body, the technology, and forward. And I wonder how that all comes together. Yeah, uh, I can speak to that. <laughs> 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 um, well, I originally asked um, Sawako to perform with Jaden A because I took Sawako's class earlier this year, and she assigned Matthew Gulish's 39 micro lectures. Uh, which is, he is someone who helped found Goat Island, which is a school in Chicago that both Judd and Abe, or just Judd, just Judd, has been involved with. Um, and something, I really loved that book and learned a lot from it, and something that I liked was this idea that a performance could be something that can't be reproduced, and that the non-reproducibility um, is a way of searching for beauty and searching for something unknown in the act of performing, like caught in the body. Um, and so I was, I, I think that that's something I see in Soako's work with um, even the commentary we saw of like, if I've done this before, I'm actually directly addressing you and I'm still searching for like the question that motivated that. And then um, also something with Judd and Abe's, which is often adapted to space. Um, that was my thinking. I actually didn't know that it would be three performances until just now. So I'd love to hear from Soako and Charlie more how that developed. Um, yeah, no, I think I, I do enjoy discomfort and feel liberated by it in artistic contexts because by setting up something unknown and uncomfortable um, and erasing that expectation of having control and having it be right and um, um, knowing means that it's a kind of surrender and an um, acknowledgement and embracing of whatever happens to be in that moment. So this piece, um, you know, Thea asked me to do it a long time ago, and I woke up on Sunday morning and thought that I would do some reiteration of a piece, that piece I'd done earlier, and then even then I still didn't know what exactly would happen, and then Wednesday I met my poetry workshop, and it was only around Wednesday when I started asking for help or volunteers or participants. So that was when um, I, you know, I asked a couple of my students and Abe usually is the first to raise his hand, but he wasn't available and Charlie was like, sure, and I thought Steen might do something because she's performative, but she wasn't gonna do it. And it was just kind of made out of who was up for it. And, um, and I, I guess 
these students were willing to trust me. Um, and then even then, after Charlie said he would do it, I just have made this piece in the last couple of days, and, and I, in the course of making the piece, it reveals itself. Um, and in the course of doing this quite feminist shtick, if you will, um, <laughs> it became clear that this is where it was gonna go. So it's um, anxiety producing, and I inflicted upon myself. And uh, thank you, Charlie, for participating in this way. I, yeah, it's, um, I'm still like processing and absorbing the sum of this, the things that we've, we've done. Um, yeah, I appreciate collaboration in that it yields like new languages or like new ways of thinking. And I usually work by like working with ceramics or things where I have to, I, if I am in control of the piece, I will suffocate it. And um, yeah, often, <laughs> I often seek out my surrender or like fear to know that it's right. Um, and so I guess there are a lot of opportunities to surrender myself to a uh, bigger picture. And so that was just intuitively correct to me. So has the binding been part of the piece of you mind? Or was that in addition just for this iteration? So um, the, the piece I did that at the Guggenheim was just me. Mm -hmm. And I used the official screen. And um, I believe I was the only one who did anything in that moment. It was a group um, poetry reading, and there were four of us. But during my piece, um, Charlie wasn't there. And it was, just, uh, it was just me. I think you mentioned duct tape. And I was like, oh my gosh, I have a piece on deck. <laughs> <laughs> that was like two days ago. Yeah. Yeah. Um, OK, go ahead, Gretchen. Um, if there's like all festival, there's you've been highlighting uh, the body. And well, this piece are obviously really caught up in the body. It's also really, they're highlighting voice. And it, I think all the uses of voice in both projects could have been recorded and played, but the fact that you've spoken for us in the space had a different um, relationship with the body and with the presence. And so I'm wondering how you think the voice in these pieces not only is, is uh, tied up in the body, but also have had a presence as well. Yeah, I mean, in a kind of fundamental way, the, the, the idea of the gorge as being part of the landscape, but also being a work of the throat, is a central way we're connecting the body to architecture, to landscape. Um, and the singing is one way in which the vocalization is starting to expand. Um, but I think we're still finding the way in which the piece should be vocalized in space. Um, I did another spin-off of it in Chicago where we had like a steel guitar and a, a synthesizer band and the whole piece is sung, and that, not really sung, but kind of sung. Um, and that was really satisfying. And I really loved not having to read in any way that sounded like I was reading a poem, mm -hmm. to have a constraint for that. So, yeah, I don't know. And, and the throat is also, is it, yeah, it's also a sexual thing, a relaxing throat. It does, it's a big part of the impetus initially for the, the sort of choice of terms and objects. And, you know. and I'll say too that um, we're also playing with having the recording at the beach, right? So we're also doing, we're doing live voice, but then we're doing recorded voice. Uh, and then we're also, we're, we're, here, we're here embodied, but we're also in character. So, so and that, that, that play is really important because the song is a cover, and so we would hear two different covers, actually. Uh, Glenn Campbell's version is not the original. And then we're, then we're covering our own performance. And so there's kind of this, 
I guess it's a bit of the whole mirrors effect where there is a there's a real embodied vulnerability here um, and yet we're also in camouflage and we're sort of deflecting our presence through these kind of mirrors. Um, One last question. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Where do you guys get these fabulous shirts? So this was my grandmother's shirt. Oh. Yeah, and that's also my grandmother's cross stitch. Um, and we, this one of the start another starting there are a few starting points for this piece, but one of them was the the house of the rhinestone cowboy, who's a man named Lloyd Bolin, who called himself the original rhinestone cowboy. He rhinestoned his house and his car and his clothing, <laughs> and I had. I I just moved. Um, got, I separated from my partner and I moved into a new apartment. My grandmother had this. I mean, she's she's passed, uh, but she had this incredibly flamboyant, excessive sense of design. <laughs> and like she was like a drag queen. You know? And. She, I, I don't know, she was just so outrageous in her tastes, and I was drawing inspiration from that at the time, and then I received this shirt, and it was amazing. Um, <laughs> so, I, yeah, I, it's, it's kind of, there's a lot of accumulation of mm -hmm. objects and movements. This was my shirt that I bought in all seriousness. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then when, when Abe and I were making the piece, I, I gave it to him and it fit him better. <laughs> it was a little bit more narrow in the chest. Um, but I, he only wears it for performance, it's still technically mine. <laughs> <laughs> but there, there's also these beautiful shirts that we didn't get to play with. That, well, we did a little bit. A little bit. And that was Stephanie's text. But the whole thing was that I had the shirt up there, and Stephanie came in and she's like, you covered up my text. <laughs> and the text was, what is it? Listen, don't forget Do their not language. forget their language. Mm -hmm. so, oh, it's Javis. Oh, I'm sorry, it was Javis. But, so that was something we were working in as well. So that was our apology for covering that text, <laughs> but also playing with the idea of covering it. Um, I was wondering about the use of human screens. Yeah. <laughs> and maybe maybe a shout out from the back. Um, how did how did that go? Were you tired? Did your arms hurt? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I it was fine. It was that no. It was chill. No, it didn't hurt. It was amazing to look at everyone's faces and not have any idea what you were laughing at. Yeah. We <laughs> but it didn't, didn't feel like you were laughing at us, which I was worried about. It kind of back to discomfort, too, because there was, there was suddenly a change, and you didn't know if it was, there was a cross, there was a sort of question of when is it performance and when is it natural. I, I like that tension, actually. It was something formal, and then you'd have to, like, scratch your arm. <laughs> so that awkwardness was also yeah, that's present. Yeah, that's some weird reaction. Oh, <laughs> and just as an aside, that thing that we're wearing is actually a screen. So I was at that parallel when we were setting up. They were doing their screen, and we were behind doing our screen. But we're just not currently projecting onto it. So it's a blank <laughs> screen. So there was a connect. There was a parallel.
discovered performance, um, I really did come to appreciate the social element of being able to issue text and have instant response, not years later response, if any. Um, and so it's a it's a it's way on the other side of the continuum in terms of writing and publishing and that kind of audience and um, immediate and not just for the pleasure, but I think because people have bothered to come and bring your bodies into this space, I, um, I feel a certain um, interest in being here together. So it, it does tend to be part of my thinking when I'm making a performance. I think, I mean, I, oh, go ahead. Sorry. So, so in terms of the interaction with your it's very unclear to me whether or not we were being called out to go and stop that. something that I love, it usually says more about me than the text says about itself, even though it's classically considered a self-same form of legibility. Um, yeah, I just would like to, I, I think we have a lot more power and agency than we're conditioned to believe. And so performance is a wonky space where you can challenge those standards of, I don't know, being in the world. And it's wonderful to, well, it's not wonderful, it's just something, <laughs> it's, I, um, yeah, I think people are entitled to help or not help, and so there have been iterations of this piece where um, not having help felt really important to me, um, but I thought that the ambiguity was more generative in terms of my own values and the kind of space that I want my work to produce. Um, and also just the fact that we're here at this elite institution, and what does that mean, and who are we trying to, who is our, our, our target audience? And so, yeah, if we expand the way we think about poetry, we can also expand it to include people from all walks of life, which is why um, I, I try and make things that read to read either graphically or gesturally or like are documenting traits and dwellings include words because everybody doesn't know how to read. Unless anyone has a question, um, let's give another round of applause to our...